Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is our authority. The Bible is the book that we use on this program to act as a resource, a book as a guidebook. But my, my, what a book this is. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the most wonderful, marvelous, stupendous book the world has ever known. There is none that uh, even begins to be in the same class with the Bible. Because the Bible is God's word to mankind. Almighty God, who created the universe, has given in one book his a record of all the laws and principles and wisdom that he wants us to know about. And it's a pity that we're not studying that Bible more and more and more because uh, any time that we can sit at the feet of God, and that's what we're doing when we read the Bible, we're actually sitting at his feet and he is speaking to us. And everything he has to say is important. And everything he has to say is perfectly wise and wonderful. But if we... A lot of times we don't understand what he has to say to us, but we can pray him. Oh, Lord, is it could it be that we can have some understanding of what we're reading? And above all, as we listen to God speak, we want to have an attitude of wanting to be obedient. And so we should be praying, and oh, Lord, help me to be obedient to whatever I find there. There just is no other book like the Bible. It, if we truly want to come to knowledge, and you know uh, the libraries of this world are filled with millions of writings of mankind, uh, each one thinking that they have written the finest book and uh, have come with the finest information, but none of these books begin to get close to the wisdom of the Bible. And therefore, if we really want knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge of that which is in very important, more important than anything that the world can produce for knowledge, we have to read the Bible. Because, you see, the Bible gets uh, it deals not only with this life, and it does very intently, but it also deals with the life after death. It, it deals with eternal, eternity future. And every human was created in the image of God so that he is, was created to exist forever. And if we have not solved our problem of relationship with God, it means that forever we'll be under eternal damnation. How terrible that is. But marvelously, this same Bible has given us the knowledge that we can, uh, can have eternal life. We can have, have uh, uh, the most wonderful future imaginable, provided Christ has become our Savior. Well, I can't say enough good things about the Bible. I'm just so delighted, so thrilled, so awed, so humbled by the fact that on this program we can use the Bible as our authority. Now we uh, want to take our call from our telephone lines b uh, right immediately, but we have a, a person here in uh, Brazil who is concerned about the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, this is the kind of a gospel that is very, very prevalent all over the world today where the idea is that if we truly are a child of God, we can speak in tongues. If we're truly a child of God, we can do miracles. If we're truly a child of God, we uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, get messages from God in a vision or a voice. Uh, and the fact is that all of that is not what the Bible is teaching. Oh, yes, our caller, our, our, our uh, listener in Brazil makes reference to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 
uh, and there God uh, says some very interesting things and and if they're not correctly read we can really get sidetracked away from the truth he says in first corinthians 12 that he uh, certain gifts are given uh, to believers to uh, to one is given faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues and we look at these and we say are these for today well the fact is almost all of them are uh, if we read it correctly unfortunately uh, those who are listening or wanting gifts of tongues and are wanting to have some kind of a manifestation they read this with a wrong interpretation altogether when it says the gift of miracles the working of miracles they think of signs and wonders like jesus walking on water or raising the dead or multiplying the loaves and the fish or or the uh, ten lepers that are healed no that gift is not in vogue at all today not at all there are no miracles of that as a matter of fact the word that is used here the gift of miracles is the word dunamis and it has it ordinarily has to do with with might or power and it's used in the sense that uh, that it is the power of Christ to raise us uh, to give us spiritual life you shall receive power dunamis when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses that's the idea it's the power of God to save and that 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 gift is still present wherever individuals are declaring the Word of God as they do it uh, in uh, outside of the churches and congregations there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved they are healed uh, they are they experience the miracle of salvation a brand new resurrected soul they are given eternal life how marvelous how wonderful that is and it, uh, here also it talks about the gift of healing the Bible isn't talking about the healing of physical illnesses then the Bible would be a failure because even those who might think they have been healed eventually they die and they die of an illness of some kind but there is an illness that is infinitely more terrible it's the disease of sin that is going to bring about eternal damnation to the sinner and uh, that terrible terrible illness can be healed when we become saved we are saved from our sins because Christ has taken all the load the penalty for our sins and and that gift is still uh, in process today wherever the gospel is being proclaimed and then it talks about the gift of prophecy uh, whenever we declare the Word of God we are prophesying every true believer is mandated by God and qualified by God to be a prophet that is to witness the gospel to others and that gift too is very much in evidence today and then it speaks about the discerning of spirits and there again that's a gift that we uh, can practice today because you see what what we have to do is listen to what someone is saying is it faithful to the word of god and if it's not faithful to the word of god it did not come from god it did not come god from god it would have to come from an evil spirit because only god uh, only the holy spirit will the holy spirit will only bring what is faithful to the word of god and then different kind of tongues and interpretation of tongues now that gift no that is not seen hasn't been seen in the world for over 1900 years uh, that is uh, a, a very minor gift that was in in practice briefly before the Bible was completed in the church at Corinth we can read about it in 1st Corinthians 14 where there were a few individuals that received information from God in a, in a mysterious heavenly language and there were others to interpret this frequently it was in the form of a prayer and this 
uh, served to edify the congregation because it was the word of God that was brought. But that possibility ceased to exist immediately when the Bible was completed. Uh, before the Bible was completed, not only could people occasionally hear uh, God speaking to them in a tongue, uh, in that mysterious language, or but they also might receive a message in a vision or a dream from God. But when the Bible was completed, God said we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book, and that ended that possibility. Now, uh, this, of course, has become the hallmark of all kinds of Gospels today, where they read about this in 1 Corinthians 14, and they say, oh, that's what I want, that's what I want. And uh, they, pretty soon, uh, it appears that they are having a supernatural experience with receiving messages in visions or tongues or dreams. And if it truly is a supernatural activity, uh, then it will not have come from God. It will have come from Satan. And that, that, those gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues, they do not exist with the true gospel, with the true gospel. If anybody is practicing those things, it's very evident, immediately, very evident, they are in a false gospel. They are in a gospel that is not the gospel of the Bible. They don't understand at all anything about really what salvation is. Well, thank you, Brazil, for that very up-to-date, pertinent question, because this is a, a kind of a, a phenomenon that is oppressing people all over the world today. But now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone line. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, um, Brother Camping. I have a couple of questions. Um, I remember in, you said that the word Deborah means the word of God. And when I look in my concordance, it doesn't say that. So I was just wondering how did, um, I guess, you come up with that. It, with that which is the word of God? Deborah. The, the name Deborah. Deborah, Deborah. Oh well, that's a Hebrew word. That's a Hebrew word, and uh, and uh, the Hebrew word for uh, now. It's been a long time since I've looked at this, and so I'm I, I'm not going to be able to say this very dogmatically. But as I recall, when I did that study on Deborah, the word Deborah is a the root word of that is is speaking or word. And you may not uh, uh, find that readily in your concordance, but uh, uh, it, it requires a little bit more research to do to find that. How would you research that? Pardon? How would you research that? Well, first of all, uh, uh, do you have a a, a Hebrew uh, a Hebrew Bible? No, I don't. You know, you see, uh, do you have a Hebrew concordance? I just have the regular, like, um, Strong's Concordance. Strong's Concordance. All right. Now, look up the word uh, for... Uh, de uh, I don't know if the Strong's Concordance has the Hebrew letters for Deborah. Uh, that may not be. You may... Have you got a... Have you got a... Uh, yes, it, it would have. Strong's would have that. And look at the, at the Hebrew letters and then look at other words... Uh, 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 right nearby, and you'll f probably find uh, a word that is translated uh, word or, or speaking that also will have the same three Hebrew letters, and that will guide you. Okay, and also I wanted to ask, um, why does God use Jacob's name after he changed his name to Israel? Why does God still use Jacob's name? Yes. Yeah, well, God, uh, uh, the word Israel means prince of God, but Jacob is still Jacob. And he, it was Jacob who was the progenitor of the 12 tribes. And so uh, God's good pleasure is to still speak of him as Jacob, but also from time to time he's spoken of as Israel. 
Now, uh, sometimes uh, an individual has more than one name. There, have, there, was, there were kings, for example. There was a king, his name was Jeconiah, but he's also called Kaniah. And he also has uh, one other name. I can't think of it right offhand. Uh, he's presented in the Bible in three different names. Now, God did not write the Bible so that it's easy to understand. Uh, God wrote the Bible, so we have to puzzle over it. We have to compare Scripture with Scripture. And we have to pray for wisdom. And we have to work diligently at this. Uh, and so uh, when God uh, uses more than one name for an individual, like he does with Jacob and Israel, uh, that he does this so that uh, uh, what he's trying to say is not as clear as what we would like to have it. We have to study a little harder. Why did he use Jacob here? Why didn't he use the name Israel? Uh, Christ, for example, is spoken of as David in the Old Testament. God gives him that name. Why would he do that? Well, because if we're not alert, we uh, can misunderstand those passages altogether. God wants us to come to the Bible with the attitude, I don't know anything, Lord. I don't know. Teach me. And I know that uh, I have to be very patient and very, uh, very diligent in studying the, your word. And also, I know I have to constantly pray that you will guide me. And this is the posture that we have to have as we come to the word of God. And lastly, um, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Um, I'm a little confused. Okay. Now, Acts 8, verses 14 and 15. Let's look at that. We read there. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen upon any of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. All right, now there were some Samaritans that were ministered to by the evangelist Philip. And as near as Philip could tell, they had, uh, they, uh, uh, had become saved. And so he sends the news back to the church in Jerusalem that God is saving people in Samaria. Well, then the church in Jerusalem dispatched uh, uh, John and uh, Peter, I believe it is, uh, to check this out. This is because the Samaritans, the cursed Samaritans, that they are becoming saved? Is that really so? And, uh, and uh, uh, when they... When they came there, they found indeed they had not become saved because they had not been in, filled with, uh, they had not come to be indwelt, indwelt by the Holy Spirit as yet. That uh, if we do not have the Spirit, we read in Romans 8 verse 9, we are none of His. And so as John and Peter ministered to these uh, individuals, they then did become saved. The Holy Spirit did come upon them. And uh, you notice that this happened after they were baptized in water. And this is one of the places where God is emphasizing that water baptism does not get us saved. Okay. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Next call, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Brother Camping, um, you said in the past that you're saved and that you know you're saved. And the, the reason why you know, the reason why you know, you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, the reason why you know you're saved is because you quoted the scripture that says, uh, the spirit bear the witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But then you've also said because salvation is twofold, that you receive your resurrected spirit, but you're still in a body that can sin, that if you were to sin, your sins have been paid for. Is that correct? Yes, you've got that correct. So my question for you is, is, is that have you, since you've become saved, uh, have you sinned? Well, yes, of course. If I look at myself honestly and measure my conduct all perfectly in the light of what the Bible is teaching, 
uh, uh, there are times when I might be walking more proudly than I should. There might be times when I'm a little impatient. There might be times when I have a thought that I shouldn't have entered in. That's all sin. That's all sin. Now, it doesn't mean that I uh, that I uh, have to do some gross sin uh, that I still might be capable of if I could keep my eyes off Christ. After all, David did that. But uh, it, uh, anything that doesn't measure up perfectly to the standard of Christ's righteousness is sin. And, and uh, we, we, uh, we know that uh, at times we're lazy a little bit. And at times we're not reading the Bible as often as we should. At times we're not trusting the Lord that we, the way we should. And any of this is sin. And so I have to go to the Lord every day. Oh, Lord, I thank Thee that, uh, that I know my sins have been paid for. And, oh, Father, help me uh, uh, forgive whatever. Uh, I know that my sins are forgiven, but, but strengthen me now that tomorrow it, uh, perhaps I'll even be more faithful to Your Word. Thing is this is that you use interesting language and you said uh, you spoke about gross sin now if sin is sin is sin and you're a child of God because you've received the new resurrected spirit and I'm a child of God because I've received the new resurrected spirit also and all your sins are paid for no matter what sin it are if it's a gross sin or I don't understand where the line is drawn but my point is this if I have adult if I have um, relations with another man's wife that sin's paid for correct Mr. Camping? Well, now, yes or no? Well, it, if if I'm truly a child of God, because we have the example of David, that's exactly what he did. But that, on the other hand, if I'm living in adultery, that is, if I, that is the my mindset uh, that this is what I want, and I and I'm constantly moving in that direction, the likelihood is I am not saved. There's a big difference, a huge difference between thinking we are saved and actually being saved. There's a huge difference between that. And you know the difference? Pardon? And you're able to tell that whether you're able to tell whether you think you're saved or whether you know you're saved? Well, the, the Bible... Where's the line? Well, see, uh, you must remember that if we have become a child of God, there's a miracle that's happened. Before we're saved, essentially we're body and soul, and in body and soul, we uh, we uh, like what we like. We want what we want. Uh, we uh, we uh, there's and there is agreement within my personality, both in my body and my soul. Uh, I might be trying to live a very moral life. That's fine. I might be, uh, but but uh, something happens when we become saved we get a brand new resurrected soul that's a tremendous miracle that god does within us in first john chapter 3 verse 9 god says that which is born of god cannot sin and you remember in john 3 jesus told nicodemus you must be born again and that is referring to the fact we have to get that new eternal resurrected soul now that may, makes a powerful impact upon my conduct because now every time I begin to think about sin or drifting towards sin in my new soul, I don't want it. I'm not happy if I fall into sin. It's, it's sheer misery for me. I, I'm happier when I'm doing the will of God, which are feelings that I never had before I was saved, before I received my new resurrected soul. Uh, and and so uh, unless we really experience that, we really don't know what it is to truly be a child of God. If we are simply trying to do well, trying to do good, uh, uh, then uh, then we have no idea what the experience of a true believer is. Last point. I'll let somebody else get on. Uh, Jeremiah 33 verse 24, and I'll prove the point. Jeremiah 33. 33 verse 24. Let's look at that. It's really through through to 26, but 24 can just hit the get the point. Let, let's look at that. Considerest thou not? 
what thou what this people has spoken saying the two families which the lord has chosen he hath even cast them off thus they have despised my people that they should be no more a nation before them thus saith the lord if my covenant be not with day and night and if i have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and earth then will i cast away the seed of jacob and david my servant as so that i will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Now, my now, question is this. Um, erroneously, I've heard you and many, many other people in Christendom over, over and over again say that God has somehow done away with the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, everybody knows that, that, that there are 12 tribes of Israel. And you use Revelation, the seventh chapter, because the tribe of Dan is not listed in order to somehow prove that that's not talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. But everyone knows that there were 12 tribes. Now, if Christ included Dan in Revelation 7, that would throw the whole 12 tribes of Israel off. And this scripture that we just read is saying, Consider not thou with this people, meaning you have spoken, the two families, Israel and Judah. You, you said that, the, that God has cast them off, that they should no more be a nation before God. There's no way that God has cast away the 12 tribes of Israel because from the beginning of the end, even in the kingdom and Revelation in the later chapters, the, 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 12, the, the names of the children of Israel are upon the gates of the city. And this is talking yeah, about well, the physical me. Israelite. Oh, well, excuse me, excuse me. I, I, the fact is, that if we study the whole Bible, we find that for about 2,000 years, God worked with the, with the 13 tribes of Israel. There were actually 13 tribes. Uh, because uh, Joseph had been given two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, they were the corporate external entity that represented the kingdom of God on this earth. And it is from them that the Lord Jesus did come. Now, the blood descendants of Abraham, they were blood descendants of Abraham, they continue right to the present day. There are Jews uh, right to the present day. But insofar as using the, uh, the, the nation of Israel as the representation of the kingdom of God, that ceased when Christ went to the cross. When the veil of the temple was rent, uh, uh, that meant that uh, as Christ was hanging on the cross, that meant that the temple, Holy of Holies, no longer uh, was a holy place, the Holy of Holies, and the temple was no longer the holy uh, uh, temple, and Jerusalem was no longer the holy city. That ended uh, God's utilization of the nation of Israel. Now those people still continued. Excuse me, I'll finish this right after this message. We're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel or the seed of Abraham. And the fact is that there were 13 tribes during the Old Testament era of about 2,000 years. Uh, and uh, then when Christ came and went to the cross, that ended God's utilization of the blood descendants of Abraham, the the physical nature, the physical nation of Israel to represent the kingdom of God. God shifted from them to the church age, and the church age was made up of believers from every nation under the world. And then God explained in, Hebrew, in Romans 2 that a true Jew was not because of circumcision, which was the, uh, the uh, sign that was put on the Old Testament Jew, but it was the uh, circumcision of the heart. It, uh, uh, and he explained in uh, Galatians chapter 3, the last verse, that the true seed of Abraham were those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament church age uh, was also spoken of as 12 tribes. And we read that in James chapter 1, verse 1. We read about that in Romans or in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 7. Uh, where it speaks of 12 tribes of Israel. These are the New Testament and they're uh, believers and they also are called Israel and they're made up of Jews and Gentiles. God is not respecting any nation any longer throughout the church age. And that was, uh, they are the 
continuation of the covenant of God. When we read in Jeremiah 33 or elsewhere about Christ's covenant continuing and that he will not reject the seed of Abraham, he is uh, speaking about the, the gospel. The, the word covenant is really a synonym for the word gospel. And the seed of Abraham is anybody who truly becomes a believer. It, it doesn't require at all that you have to be a blood descendant of Abraham. As a matter of fact, those who are blood descendants of Abraham are spoken of and who are not true believers, God speaks of them as not being the Israel of God. They are outside of the covenant. They are outside of the gospel. Now he's, God has made one more shift. The gospel continues. It is not, it is not uh, 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 cut back in any way. But now God is not utilizing either the entity of the nation of Israel as he did uh, until the time of Christ, nor is he using the entity, the, the or, a divine organization he had organized for the, during the church age. Now he is using individuals to send out the gospel into the world, and, and he's finishing up his task of evangelization through these individuals. But, and these individuals can be blood descendants of Abraham, or they can be Gentiles. makes no difference. God is not, not uh, limiting it in any way whatsoever. It has nothing to do with nation, national uh, character or anything of that nature. One last question. Brother Camping? Yes. Yes. Uh, you've said many times before that Christ and the Father are the same, and that, that and that this is an impossibility according to the Bible, because if Christ was crucified on the cross, and you've said many times that he's endured the, that he endured the wrath of hell and paid for the sins of those you came to save, then if they were one being and not two separate entities of one purpose, then that would have been to have meant that God, the Father, endured the wrath of hell. Is that what your doctrine is? Well, the fact is, when we're talking about God, we have a, a we have to be very humble because in our minds we cannot understand an infinite being such as God is. God has not designed our little minds to understand an infinite God who speaks and brings this magnificent creation into existence. Unfortunately, a lot of people in their pride they think they can understand God, but you can't understand God. All we can do is is uh, read what the Bible says and 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 say yes that's true because the Bible says this about God but we don't understand when Jesus said I and the Father are one we don't understand that when he says in in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily we don't fully understand that when Jesus is coming out of the Jordan River having been baptized and uh, and there's a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. We, we don't understand how all of that can be. We read about it, and we know it's true, but we don't understand it. For example, the Bible emphasizes that Christ was the high priest that offered the, the sacrifice, but he was also the lamb. How could that be? Christ was the lamb. How could he be the high priest? We don't understand that. But we know it's true because God has said so. And, you know, it's very important that when we come to the Bible, we walk very, very humbly, very, very humbly. Because the moment we think we're beginning to say, and particularly when we're talking about God, I know this or I know that, uh, we better watch out because God resists the proud and pride goes before a fall. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Would you please compare Jeremiah 30, chap uh, chapter 30, verse 7? Je Jeremiah 30, verse 7. There we read, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But what, what did you want to compare that with? Uh, Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, uh, 
And they're probably a relationship because uh, uh, Jacob's trouble has to do with the time of great tribulation in which we're in right now. And Daniel 12, verse 1, also is speaking about that same time. There will come, I'm just finding that, Daniel 12. Daniel 12, verse 1, And at that time shall Michael, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And uh, that, I believe, is speaking about the same time frame as Jeremiah 30. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. I hope you don't mind. I got the rule a few days ago, but I haven't called in a few months. Is that okay? Well, you're running a risk. If you call more than once a, a month, you might have your your phone cut off. So you're running a risk. But go ahead. I understand, but I honestly haven't called in a few months. All right, um, Revel I was at a different phone number. All right, this is Revelation 22-7. Revelation 22-7? Yeah. Yeah. Can you read that? I want yeah. to ask you a question on that. Uh, and behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, verse 7. Right. Okay, I read that. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy. Um, I know there's a lot of debate. Um, people say they're talking about just Revelation, or and you say they're talking about the whole Bible. And I just wanted to say I think this says... Um, keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. The, the same things that are in Revelation are in the whole Bible. In other words, well, the only you, saying, you know, that have to do with the commandments, it's what the whole Bible says. Like it says the people that are liars and whoremongers, that's throughout the whole Bible. Like, you know what I mean? So. Well, as a matter of fact, we can't. <laughs> I'm not, sorry if I'm not ex explaining ex it to you. Excuse me. We can't keep the sayings of the book of Isaiah, of uh, Revelation unless we read the whole Bible because we need the whole Bible to help us understand the book of Revelation. And so it ultimately it com works out that it's simply talking about the Bible itself. And I'm just saying that the only, like the word sayings, what does the word sayings mean in that verse, in 22.7? It, everything in the Bible is recorded are the sayings of God. God said, this is what God has declared to us. Or what the whole Bible already says. Yes. It's saying what's going to happen to the people that didn't keep the sayings of the whole book. So there's really no argument. <laughs> All right, thank you for uh, calling and sharing. Now, look, you, let, let, let's go on to another caller now. We don't, you don't want to abuse your privilege. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. Uh, yeah. I want to say that I admire your patience. Uh, I have a couple parts uh, on my question. Uh, my question is uh, involving a, uh, uh, in getting into business with another individual. So I read in the Bible that we are supposed to partake for instance, in a marriage, we're not to be unequally yoked. Um, and I'm also uneasy with the fact that if I'm to be a business partner with an individual that is not a believer, that also could uh, cause potential problems down the line. Is that uh, I want you to answer that, and then I have a couple of questions I want to ask. Yeah, well, that you see, the most, the, the tightest bond is in the marriage union because the two become one flesh. Of course, once we're married, we can't divorce. We have to live in that terrible situation, and uh, and and it's just it just makes life exceedingly difficult for us. But uh, we never want to go into that kind of a situation. Uh, uh, that's why we have to be careful about who we marry. But the same is true. If we uh, enter into a partnership with a with a, someone else and start running a business it's not going to go well at all uh, because uh, you have different uh, uh, 
ideas of how you want to use that business, how you want to spend your time in that business, how, how, uh, how, what your goals are, and so on. Uh, uh, the, the beautiful thing about the business is it may be difficult, but eventually you can, if you find yourself in that kind of a business arrangement, you can finally sell your position out to someone else. You're not bound like you are in marriage. But again, uh, it, the principle applies. Don't be unequally yoked. Uh, yes, uh, that's what I was thinking. So, in in trying not to be, in trying not to sin, and trying to remain faithful to the gospel, I thought that um, you know I I have to make money to live. So, uh, but I can't do it in a way that is not God glorifying. Therefore, I decided to say to my partner, say, look. Um, you can be the owner and I can work for you in that sense and I cannot work on Sundays and you can take all the money Sundays but I'm still uneasy with the feeling that uh, that person is getting into a business where he is going to work Sundays himself and if I'm going to witness to him and one day God touches his heart and he becomes um, saved or you know I feel uneasy about that I feel guilty about this, you know, the fact that this person is getting into a business that um, involves working Sunday. Well, you'll have to pray for wisdom on that, but whatever he does, that's his sin. It's not yours. You probably are also uneasy uh, simply because you, uh, you uh, subconsciously realize you're giving away something that is valuable and you're you're you don't really like to do that or your business judgment says that's not a a very smart thing to do but yet it is something that uh that you you're thinking in the right direction about that you should be separated uh, do you just yeah, pray i have no uh quarrels about keeping any money for sunday work or anything like that in fact uh um i did mention that even if you keep the money i would prefer that you donate it to a charity, even though that might, might doesn't make any difference, that's just work. Yeah, but but um, still, uh, no, no, I don't want to be part of that at all. But is that some business that I could be involved in as a, so to speak, worker for an individual, but not being a partner on no, the piece? You know, we, uh, everyone has to have a job. If we, we have to earn a living, and. Uh, most businesses in the world are secular in nature, and if we had to find a business where, where uh, uh, an organization where everyone were true believers, we wouldn't be able to work because there aren't enough of them around. So, uh, no, that as long as we don't engage in any sin. In other words, if we belong to an organization or are working for a, a, an organization or a boss and they ask us to lie or cheat or do things contrary to the Word of God, work on Sunday and so on, we have to say, no, I can't do that. And uh, uh, we just have to make sure our conscience is clear, clear with the Lord. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping? Yes. I would like to ask you a question about a couple of verses in the Bible. Yes. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30. Matthew 24, and which verse? Uh, 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, what did you want to ask about that? Are we talking about the last day, the final judgment, the second coming of Christ, right? Yes, this is the end of the world, and when it talks about the the, uh, the sun is darkened and the moon does not give her light and so on, it means there is no more mercy, no gospel, no possibility of salvation. That has come to an end. The day of salvation is gone. 
and simultaneously we see Christ coming as the judge of all the earth and uh, and if we're not saved it's guaranteed we will stand for judgment and be found guilty and be uh, sent to hell forevermore if we are a child of God well, at that moment, we will instantly be raptured. We'll be changed into our glorified spiritual body and raptured or caught up to be with Christ in the air. The second part of my question, Brother Camping, is if we skip down to verse 34, and if you could just read verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Okay, now my question is, when he says this generation shall not pass, he's talking about all the people that are alive at that time before they die. No, he is not. He is not. He is not. That's not possible. That's not possible because, after all, the world has gone on, along, uh, on for hundreds of years after that. So there's no possibility. What he is talking about is the generation of evil. The generation of evil. We, we, uh, we uh, uh, find uh, elsewhere in the Bible that, that uh, uh, where, where God is, is, is speaking of the, the generation of evil. That, in other words, wickedness will be in the world as long as the world exists. The generation of evil will not have disappeared. At various times, you know, there have been people who have thought, well, maybe someday before the end of the world, there will be a time when uh, the whole world will be righteous and following Christ. No way, no way. There will be evil men in the world, that is, wicked men in the world, right up until the end of the world. Now, Brother Camping, I mean, uh, are you, you're sure of this. I mean, you're, you've studied this for a number of years, and, and this is what you feel, this is what he means, the generation of evil, no. not the generation of the people who are then living. Well, it, 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 first of all, it's totally impossible it could be the people that were living then because it's talking about the return of Christ. Christ didn't return 1,900 years ago. This was written... Uh, al almost 2,000 years ago, and that would have meant that Christ had would have returned 1,900 years ago. That's not that didn't happen. That's no. The world has been going on for 1,900 years, so we know immediately it, there isn't the slightest possibility it could be that. And yet, on the other hand, when we read elsewhere in the Bible, uh, it does talk about. Uh, uh, for example, we read. In, uh, in verse 50 of Luke 11, Luke 11, verse 50, the blood of all the prophets which were, sh were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, same language, this generation. Now, then God describes what blood uh, has to be required. For the, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Uh, it shall be required of this generation. Well, Abel lived 11,000 years earlier. How could he, how could he uh, uh, make the people that were living at that time, uh, or at the time that Jesus is speaking, guilty of the blood of Abel? Well, the reason is, is that the word generation is not talking about the people who were living then. It's the, it's the generation of evil that has been in existence ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And, and God is simply saying, this will continue to be here right up until Christ returns again. But you know, on the Good News Bible, that's the English translation of Good News Bible, and I don't have that in front of me, but I believe it does say uh, that. It does say um, that, you know, it's the generation of people. Yeah. I can't find it. Well, I don't, I don't know what Bible you're using, but, but I, 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 this generation is the generation of evil. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Kathy, God bless you. If you could take me through Revelation... Oh, could you turn your yep. radio off, please? I'm going to turn it off. All right, if you could take me through Revelation um, 20 and 21. 20 and 21, yes. Um, when it talks about the harlot 
in Revelations, actually 19. It talks about 17 and 18. Uh, 18. Who is the yeah. great harlot in 18? The great harlot are the churches and congregations that uh, that have uh, are increasingly begun to follow their own doctrines rather than the faithfully following the doctrines of the Bible. And uh, finally, uh, God has uh, finished uh, uh, with them. Their work has been completed. And uh, and uh, he, the Holy Spirit has departed from them. And he has uh, loosed Satan so that Satan now can uh, rule in those congregations. And so now they are spiritually altogether a harlot. They're called uh, Babylon. They, that's just another name. Uh, that uh, that is derived from the kingdom of Satan, uh, because uh, uh, the ki the kingdom of Babylon in the Bible was typifying uh, the kingdom of Satan. Okay. Here's where it gets confusing. Now, in 18, it says uh, 23, and the light of the candlestick shall shine no more. So the candlestick is taken out. Then in chapter 19, it goes on, and it says. Um, Let's see, the 19, uh, I think it's 20, it says, And he laid hold on the dragon and the old serpent, which is the devil, and bound him a thousand years. Now, this comes right after chapter 18 and 19. So now he's binding the devil up for a thousand years. And when you go down, it says he will be loosed in a little season. Yeah, yeah, well, excuse me. First, okay. of, first of all, the book of Revelation is not chronological. It is not chronological. It's a series of visions that God gave to the Apostle John as he is giving us this information. And, uh, and each chapter stands on its own feet. Uh, for example, already in Revelation 6, God is talking about Judgment Day of Christ coming and, and, uh, in, in, and the sun being darkened and so on. It's the end of the world. Uh, then in Revelation 7, he speaks about the 144,000 who have to fi finish their work. Of, and that's the church age, as, and so on. A, each each uh, Revelation 20 actually is backing up. It's going starting at the cross again. That's when Christ bound Satan. And then at the end of the uh, church age, uh, coincidental with the beginning of the Great Tribulation time, he loosed Satan, and that's what brought about Great Tribulation, because Satan uh, is, enters into the churches and rules there, as we read in Second Thessalonians 2, the man of sin takes a seat in the temple, and he rules there a little season, that is the season of the latter reign, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, then finally, finally, uh, judgment comes upon him. Now, was the church described as wearing white linen? Well, when it's the white linen, we read in one place where it's the righteousness of the saints, and the righteousness of the saints is the righteousness of Christ, that his righteousness is counted for us. And uh, uh, to pick up an Old Testament figure, uh, it's called the robe of, of Christ's righteousness. Right. So what would be your best description of um, the end of the church age? As a, the, one of the best scriptures that you say this is the most powerful scripture I could give to say this is the end of the church age. And uh, we, know what, we know at a timeline to look for and say, okay, that's a clear sign. I, I, I'm, I'm sure the tribulation. Well, the, the, there, uh, there's there's a whole lot of scriptures. Uh, the best thing to do is read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is really today's newspaper. It is describing what is happening today, and uh, and uh, we can see God's wrath that is coming on the churches and congregations uh, through the book of Jeremiah. We read the same thing in Matthew 24 where it speaks in verse 15 that, uh, that the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place. And the only holy place throughout the church age that existed was the, were the churches and congregations, because that is where the gospel should have been found, and that is what God was using to evangelize the world. But now we're told to flee out of that. We can read Luke chapter 21, where God says in verse 4 and 5 that the 
that not, there'll be not one stone left upon another in the temple that will not be thrown down. And when we compare that with 1 Corinthians 3, we see that uh, that uh, the believers are are living stones. They are they are costly stones uh, that are part of the building blocks of the temple. And now they're all thrown down. And the there's information about this spread all through the Bible. Uh, and there isn't any single verse that says it so plainly. Uh, 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 once we understand that when Christ is talking about Babylon in in Revelation 17 and 18, that that is uh, speaking of the local congregations, then it gets very plain because in verse 4 it says, Come out of her, my people, lest you be partaker of her plagues. And now the church, the church was considered Jerusalem, but then he's now he's calling her Great Babylon. Is that because Babylon is now bad at that time, like the church is bad? Yeah, Babylon is the name of the kingdom of Satan, and it has because Satan is ruling in the churches, as we read in Second Thessalonians two, the man of sin who can be shown to be Satan is taking his seat in the temple. Therefore, the church has become the palace of, of Satan. And that's why the church is called Babylon, because God typifies the kingdom of Satan by the name Babylon. But thank you for calling. We're going to have to pause for this message, and then we'll go to our next caller. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I have a question I'd like to ask. Yes, go right ahead with it. Okay, it's about uh, the end of the church age. Yes. Yeah. Okay, now, um, you, had, you say that uh, this, we're supposed to get out of the church, am I correct? Well, that's what the Bible says, that we are to, to come out of her because otherwise we will... Uh, because God is not operating in the church, no one is becoming saved there any longer. Okay, what about the uh, the rapture? Okay, uh, if you say that God's supposed to come back for his church. So if everybody's out of the church, uh, who is he coming back for? Well, the, we have to remember the word church in the Bible can be talking about the local congregation. We call that a church because there are believers, but there are also a lot of non-believers in that church. We call that a church. Then God also speaks of the church as those who have truly become saved. They are the eternal church. We never can come out of that. We, uh, we, uh, that's an eternal congregation that we belong to when we have become saved. And every true believer that uh, throughout the church age has been sprinkled in various congregations, that is, he's found in this congregation or that congregation, or a member of that eternal church. But anyone who thinks they're saved, and uh, and the Bible has a whole lot of people, uh, the churches have a whole lot of people like that in them, uh, they are not the uh, part of the eternal church. They are still under the wrath of God. Now, when Christ comes and raptures, uh, his people, he uh, that is on, uh, on the last day, he raptures the true believers. They are th those who are part of the eternal church, not those who are in the local congregation. That is not an eternal church. That clears that up for me, because I was wondering how could he do that. Okay, I have another question. Okay, uh, about the number, about the, no the number forty. Yes. Okay, you know, like he forty days and forty nights that it rained, and uh, he was in the uh, in the garden for forty days. So, what's the what's the significance of the number forty? Well, we when we see how God uses the number forty or four hundred or four thousand, we uh, find that it is normally in the setting of testing. Jesus, for example, was tempted by the Satan for forty days. Uh, the uh, Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law for 40 days, and Israel was tested. They failed the test. They made the golden calf. 
They were in the wilderness for 40 years. They were tested, and they failed the test. They never came to believe on God, and so they perished in the wilderness because of unbelief. Forty normally is the number of testing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've up a lot for me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campion. Yes. Thank you for taking my call. Um, almost on every page of Scripture, or on every page of the Bible, you can find where it talks about false pro- Christ and false prophets and, and so forth. If we, if we evangelize with that kind of language, can and does God save um, in discussing these type of people? Well, I'm not sure I understand your question. In other words, as we send out the gospel, uh, there's going to be others who are out there peddling their gospel, and if it isn't the gospel of the Bible, that is, if it has a different authority, uh, or in our day, if it is still identified with a church or a congregation, then God is not blessing that. Uh, God now is using individuals. Uh, we can We can band together in a ministry like family radios to do collectively which we with what we couldn't do as individuals but but we're still doing it as individuals but there again there are individuals who care, who are bringing a gospel that's not the true gospel they they believe that God is still bringing uh, messages and visions and dreams and or they believe in tongues or uh, and so then it's a false gospel even though they are individuals bringing that gospel right well I'm not talking about the false gospels that are out there but I'm talking about as, as we present the gospel in our presentation describing what God teaches in his word about false you know what to look for in um, false gospels can God use that is, is, in other words in our true gospel in presenting the gospel in what is described well, in the word well, can the, God use that to save well the, the, you see the, the, this this is the mysterious character of the Bible God works through his word to save he doesn't work through our a beautiful uh, uh, argumentation or b- b- beautiful presentation. He works through His Word, and and uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means everything in the Bible, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, is uh, is uh, given. Uh, uh, as, as the word of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, for teaching. And so we have to bring the whole counsel of God. We don't ride a hobby horse. We don't ride, just bring some things that we uh, are particularly interested in, but we try to be faithful in bringing everything that the Bible teaches. And, and uh, that's why we want to continually study the whole Bible. And how God applies that word to the hearts of someone that he plans to save, that's entirely God's business. We, we, uh, we have no idea how he does that and when he will do that. So I guess, you know, in, in the, the, uh, the purpose of my question is, is, I guess, that I'm trying to find a balance between not rallying or crusading against false gospels, but also faithfully clearing the word of God. I guess that's where I'm going. Well, the, the, see, the, 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 the fact is that uh, if you are speaking from uh, 1 Corinthians 14, then you're going to be talking, warning about the tongue situation. Uh, if uh, if you're speaking from a passage in Jeremiah or Ezekiel that is warning about uh, uh, people who are are coming with doctrines out of their own mind, then you'll be speaking about that. But uh, we just faithfully have to declare whatever the Bible says, and and uh, we don't we don't we're not out crusading against this or against that. We're out just trying to be faithfully declaring what the Bible says. And, uh, of course, the, the main thread, the golden thread that runs through the Bible is the message of salvation, that we're sinners. And that, uh, that uh, it requires an enormous act of God to save us. And, 
and that he has a people that he will save and and uh, we uh, we uh, know that he saves through the word of god so a big emphasis has to be uh, to encourage people to read the bible read the bible uh, with a desire to be obedient to it and praying for that obedience because if god intends to save them he will work through the reading of the bible but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello hello good yes. evening good evening welcome to open forum yes uh good evening uh brother campus yes uh yes i have a uh, question on uh corinthians 12 on Colossians? Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, yes. Yes, it's speaking about the tongue. I just heard you was uh, talking about the tongue. Do you believe in the tongue? Yeah, well, see, uh, uh, that, that gift of tongues ended when the Bible was completed. There are all kinds of people today, however, that don't, that, that like the idea that if they receive a a message from God as they're praying in some kind of an unknown language, uh, that that might prove that God has a special uh, interest in them. And so that's a very popular doctrine today, but it is not in accordance with the Word of God. It is altogether false today. And those who are interested in tongues are following a gospel that under no circumstance will ever bring them salvation. Uh, well, uh, I go to a church that they speak tongues, um, so am I in the wrong church? Oh, absolutely. You have a church that they have a, a different authority than the Bible alone. The Bible teaches that we're only to listen to the Bible, but they are listening to uh, what the, the pastor may say he had received some message in a vision or someone else uh, says they had heard something from God in a dream or someone else uh, comes and says uh, that he's able that he's receiving a divine message as he prays in a tongue of some kind all of that is rebellion against God that that is not uh, uh, that they have a different authority than the Bible alone and therefore it's not a church that you want a, a group of uh, uh, th uh, kind of thinking you want to be involved in at all. Okay, one more thing. How do I really come to grip? Uh, because when I read uh, Corinthian, 1 Corinthians 12 about the tongues and the diverse tongues and the different, it's kind of, uh, so it's telling naturally that people have the gift. Well, but the fact is we have to read that in the light of the whole Bible. You have to read that also read Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, where God says that we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book, nor do we take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. Those who are bringing their message uh, to the congregation because they had a vision or because they're speaking in a tongue, they're claiming they have a, an additional word from God. And so they're in violation of Revelation chapter 20, uh, 22, verse 18 and 19. So you just don't want anything to do with that at all. Listen only to the Word of God. Listen only to the Word of God. That is to the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Champion. Yeah. Thanks for taking my call. I have a couple of questions. A few minutes ago, you were talking to a young man about uh, the, the the tribes of Israel and um, their place in the yes. in God's scheme of things. And I am a bit confused here because in Revelation chapter seven verses 4 through 8 it says that 144,000 of um, the 12 tribes of Israel yes, have now, the notice, excuse of God me. on their forehead 
Yeah, but notice that in Revelation 7, it says there are 12,000 from each of all the tribes of Israel. Well, now, actually, there were 13 tribes, and only 12 are named. And you don't, for example, you don't find a tribe of Dan named. And so that means it's not talking about national Israel. It's talking about the Israel of God who were typified by these 12 tribes. And the 12,000 times 12, making 144,000, are not a literal number. They are a symbolical number uh, because God has saved a great many more people than 144,000. They're a symbolical number to indicate the complete fullness of all who would become saved throughout the church age. This is, uh, once we understand that, then that passage begins to make sense to us. Now, what is the significance of in Revelation chapter 21, um, in verse uh, 12, 13 down there, it says that the, the gate of the, um, the holy city had the tribes, the, the names of the tribes were written yeah. on the gate. Yes, well, but the it has, uh, we read in verse 12, it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, which 12 tribes? There were 13 tribes. And so this is simply emphasizing the names of all those who had become believers that throughout the church age, they, they uh, together with the with the uh, nation of Israel, whoever had become believers, although there were very few believers in the Old Testament, but uh, but uh, there were a remnant chosen by grace from the nation of Israel throughout the New Testament era that have become believers. But it's okay, not. May I ask another question? In Acts chapter eight, uh, verses twenty-six through forty. Uh, you were speaking to someone earlier on about um, baptism um, not being um, important. If I have taken you out of context, um, uh, forgive this, and if you would correct me on this. But in Acts chapter 8 there, mm -hmm. why was it so important that Philip went and ministered to this um, Ethiopian eunuch? and baptize him well but you see uh, uh, we god is is uh, dealing with the subject of water baptism here in acts chapter 8 because these were the these were baptized by philip uh, just like in earlier on we read about the or, or a little later on in Acts chapter 8, we read about uh, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptized in water. And God is teaching us that water baptism is not what saves people. Water baptism is the work that we do. It is an outward sign or a shadow that is pointing to what must happen if we're going to become saved. We have to have our sins washed away. And so it's, uh, yeah, God is, uh, we, 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 as we look at this language very carefully in the language of Acts 10 and the language of Acts 19 and other places, we find that, of course, water baptism cannot save anyone. It is a work that we do. And, and the, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 8, God says that we're saved by through faith, that is through Christ, and not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our works cannot contribute to our salvation. But there is a baptism that is required for our salvation. That is the washing away of our sins. That is baptism in the Spirit, which only God can do. We can't get ourselves we can't have our sins washed away. God has to do that. And that is substantive. That's where the real action is. Water baptism is only a shadow or a sign uh, pointing to the necessity of having that kind of washing. Uh, 
Can you say that at that point in time, water baptism was important, but at this time it has worn out its importance? Well, it, it, water baptism uh, uh, was a ceremonial law that was employed throughout the church age, like the Lord's table. Uh, and now that we uh, don't, God is not utilizing churches anymore to evangelize. He doesn't recognize these institutions any longer. We don't have any place where there are elders or deacons that can supervise, that can have the spiritual oversight of that kind of activity. And so, of course, we can't baptize in water any longer or we can't observe the Lord's table. That does not affect our salvation in any way whatsoever because neither of these were substantive any, in any sense in our salvation they were simply pictures or portraits they were signs that were uh, given to the church age to assist in helping to understand a little bit better what salvation is what is required for salvation unfortunately the churches very early on abused these ceremonial laws they began to call them sacraments and they began to put all kinds of spiritual substance into them so that today there are many denominations that even teach that water baptism is a requirement for salvation or water baptism will initiate salvation or water baptism will guarantee salvation now, all of that is totally contrary to the word of god okay may i ask one last question yes Okay. Um, am I right in saying that um, Christ died for the sins of the elect prior to the foundation of the earth? Yes, that is correct. That's a correct statement, that he is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth, and he only came to pay for the sins of the elect. That we know from other scriptures. And thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Harold, who are you of? I'm sorry? Who are you of? Are you of God? Who are the elect? No, who are you of? Are you of God? Oh, uh, uh, I am simply a, a servant of the Lord teaching. I'm a teacher of the Word of God. That's... Uh, I, I have no other big credentials. I simply study the Word and try to share it as faithfully as I possibly can. But you can't be of God because you, you teach, everything you're teaching is different than God had, has written. Well, now, are you sure about that? I'm or are you, excuse me, or are you saying that I am teaching different than your church teaches? No, Harold, I read the Bible. I believe I have the truth. The truth has set me free. All right, then the what, what, excuse me, where in do you find that I am teaching contrary to the Bible? What, can you give me a specific uh, uh, example of that? Yes. Uh, the Lord's Supper means nothing to you. Baptism means nothing baptize? to you. Uh, well, well excuse me, excuse me. The 12 tribes of Israel, and uh, Babylon is the church, and it isn't it's a city. It says right in the Bible there, Babylon, that great city, and where all the ships and all they they deal with all this stuff in the in the sea. It's a city. It's going to burn. That is what, that's what the Word of God says. It's plain as day. You turn everything around. Where do you get this from? It's not from God. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, let, let, for example, Babylon. Let, let me read two verses to you. This, now, this is God speaking. These are not my words. These, this is God speaking. In Jeremiah chapter 6, we read in verse we read in verse 23, as God is talking about judgment coming upon Israel or uh, Jerusalem, he calls it Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. And, and he says here, they shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. 
Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men of war against thee, O daughter of Zion. This is God's judgment on Jerusalem, and it can be shown that Jerusalem is a, is a name for the churches and congregations. Now, hold your finger there, and I'm going to read Jeremiah chapter 50. Uh, uh, and uh, and it's, it's, we read in verse 42, it uh, talks about a people coming from the north. They shall, this is verse 42 of Jeremiah 50. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel. They will not show mercy. Notice it's exactly the same language as the uh, verse I read in Jeremiah 6. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride upon horses. Everyone's put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. That's now Israel. it's Babylon. Back in verse chapter 6, it was Zion. And so God is indicating there's a time when Zion or Jerusalem is Babylon. And we, this is, these are words that God is writing. And, and just because uh, you have not read these verses and a whole lot of other verses that deal with this subject, you don't have to conclude that someone who is saying these things is wrong. What you should do is start reading these verses very carefully. Read the whole Bible. I do, Harold. I do. I read the whole Bible. All right. Did you? What did you think about these two verses? Harold, death, Israel. Armies are going to come against Israel. They're going to come into a big battle, and that's what that's talk. That's the Battle of Armageddon. That's what that's talking about. You're correct. It is the Battle of Armageddon, but the Battle of Armageddon is Judgment Day. It is the end of the world. That's it is not on the church, though, Harold. That has to do with Israel. That whole bi the whole Bible has to do with Israel. We are just. We are just a, a vine that was grafted in. We are, the true vine is Israel. That's God's chosen people, his elect. That's what that's all about. Yeah. The whole Bible is written for Israel and his elect. For the Jews. For the Jews. And that's who their God is. Yeah, God's yeah. excuse me, excuse me. Again, let me turn, bring you back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians, or let me look first at Romans chapter 2. Let's, let's see what's what God says about what you're saying. In Romans chapter 2, God says in, uh, in, in, uh, verse, uh, uh, 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That was the character of national Israel. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. In other words, uh, uh, the uh, true Jew is someone who has had his sins cut away who has really become a child of God. And that's why God says in Galatians chapter 3, uh, in verse uh, 29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Not because you're a blood descendant of Abraham are you a true Jew, but uh, or the seed of Abraham, but if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, or verse 7 of Galatians chapter 3. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, that is of, and, uh, Christ is the, is our faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So, you may have to do some more reading. Keep reading the Bible. Keep reading the Bible. Don't be satisfied that you think you have it all figured out. But thank you for calling and sharing. I have to say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.